we go. All right. Hello and welcome to episode 217 of the Chills of Will podcast. Pleasure to be joined by Jeffrey or Jeff Charlotte. Jeff Charlotte is New York, the New York Times slash national bestselling author of The Family and C Street. He's also executive producer of the 2019 Netflix documentary series based on the work with the documentary also called The Family. His newest book and the thrust of our conversation today is The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. He is the Frederick Sessions BB35 professor in the art of writing, excuse me, at Dartmouth College. Good evening. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me, Pete. Good to be with oh, you. Oh, so great to talk to you. Can I, am I guessing right that it's that, um, like the chair that you hold or the, in the department, is that like 1935 a graduate? A 1935 graduate who's, oh. uh, uh, who was publisher of the Washington Post during uh, Watergate. Mm -hmm. And if folks have seen that Watergate movie, Fritz Beebe, um, uh, I can't remember the actor who portrays him, but you uh -huh. know, that was like, he, he, he was instrumental in, in the life of the paper, but instrumental in the life of the nation in terms of sure. his role. So his family endowed uh, a chair and they gave it to me. And that's what helps yeah. me write my books. All right. So, um, I mean, was that the same? Does he have, did he have the same role as like as Jeff Bezos does now? With the Washington Post, that is? Good question. Huh. Um, no, in the sense he was not supplying the money. He had He's a business. More on the yeah, 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 yeah. He had he, he played some kind of business role in in the paper. Yeah, I guess yeah. You. No, no, he did not uh, invent Amazon. Yeah, the Jeff. Yeah, they, 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 someday there will be a Jeff Bezos chair, and then sure. someone has to hold it. And what an embarrassing! Like in the one hand, you're like glad. All right, this is paying my salary. In the other <laughs> hand to be called the Jeff Bezos professor. Not cool. Yeah, a little bit of a difference in uh, in salary scales and difference in kind of oh scope, scope. Elon right? Musk professor, ugh, ugh. <laughs> but this is, this is the history of, you know, I mean, Dartmouth College where I teach is named after the Earl of Dartmouth who really had very little to do with the founding of the college. He gave a little bit of money, but the re it should be named Occam, who is- uh, Okay. Uh, an 18th century best-selling writer, an indigenous man, a Native American man, best-selling writer. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, we want to found this college. And everyone loved his books. So they said, go on a tour of England and raise money. Mm. And one of the donors with Dartmouth. And so they named it Dartmouth instead of Occam College. But I would. Uh... Anyway, this is not our, our, wow. our topic. is not <laughs> Dartmouth College history, but there we go. Well, shoot, we can do a whole episode on that. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and no relation to Occam's Razor. No, no, di okay. different Occam, right? But like, right. You know, that's the thing. If you called your college Occam College, it would have that resonance. And people oh, would like, man. what? That college is the bottom line. That that college is the the straight deal. So Yeah. I think we figured Dartmouth, it all out in these few know, minutes. It's all about, what does it even uh, mean? Uh -huh. It's yeah. all about connections, right? We figured out there's so many connections. Everything is connected. It's like three degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know? Man. Exactly, exactly. Six degrees. Well, Six. Uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to talk to you, like I said. And um, I'd love to know, you know, some of what, what shaped you as a reader and a writer. Um, you know, we, we always, the bookworm as a kid, you know, we, are you from a, like a professor's family? Um, what kind, what were you, what were you reading was, you know, was the written word, um, a big part of your childhood, I guess, is my question. Yeah, it, it, it was. And it's funny that you asked from um, a professor's family. Uh, my dad was a professor and I swore never to be a professor. Mm. Um, my sister is a professor. She's a, wow. a professor of medieval Arabic and Persian literature. I didn't go to graduate school, so I'm out. And then I became a writer. And that's the other path you might end up mm. in academia and sure. uh, my dad was a sovietologist which is someone who studied a political scientist who studied the soviet union it's a discipline that doesn't exist anymore because there's no uh -huh. soviet union anymore sure. um but uh, you know the thing that allows me to write i think about right-wing movements in particular in the united states and books like the undertow and so on mm. is and i want to be careful about how i do this uh, as a kid i love books many kids loved, uh, Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I was really fascinated with that kind of magical world building. And as I got older uh, and understood those things aren't real, 
I'm still interested in that. And, and when I go into these kind of right-wing communities, and I think this allows me to see what they're doing, because most of us were not of that political inclination to see the, like, the ugliness of the right. And I, and I definitely see that. But I also see them engaged in acts of world building. Right. Um, right. That they are trying to do the same thing. That they are trying to imagine what, in their minds, would be a utopian world, right? And yet there are many obstacles, you know, it's it's uh, it's the Lord of the Rings. And, and it's funny because so many of these right wingers love those same texts. They uh -huh. love the, Lord of the Rings. I remember reporting at a mega church and they had used all kinds of Lord, Lord of the Rings reference. C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, uh -huh. of course, is a Christian allegory, although I didn't know that when I was a kid okay, and yeah. probably wouldn't have liked it if I had. So, <laughs> yeah, it, I was a bookish kid and a comic book kid. Uh -huh. and uh, I think that enabled me to uh, fall up into the kind of the weird and magical and more frightening world of of right wing movements today. Sure. Obviously, like you said, it's kind of an it's kind of extinct the idea of the Sovietology, but mm -hmm. I also have to figure it was a small world. Like, did he would he have worked with like Condoleezza Rice? No, I didn't work with Condoleezza Rice. My dad was older than that. Uh, okay. He. Um, uh, and I think this is formative too, when I think about like, uh, you know, talking about how one becomes a writer and how one learns these things. So my yeah. father, uh, um, this is going to college in the 1950s, you have to do military service sooner or later. So he decides he's going to drop out of college um, and he's going to do his military service and he's going to write his great American novel. And yeah. lucky him, he gets sent to army language school. Mm. And he learns Czech and Russian. Oh. And he gets sent to West Germany. And it's a fantastic Cold War. His job is to listen to things, you know, intercept things and 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 translate them and then wander around uh, West Berlin. So his younger brother, after whom I'm named, 1963, six years younger, decides, OK, I'm going to do the same thing. This looks great. I'm going to drop out of college and go to Army Language School. It's 1963. So they say, you're going to learn Vietnamese. Whoa. And he tries to funk out and they say, nobody funks Vietnamese. And he gets sent over and it's contagious. Contagious, yeah. <laughs> um, he gets sent over. So it's my uncle Jeff. He gets sent over and uh, his very first job is translating um, what was the assassination, the U.S. Uh, essentially san sanctioned assassination of Ho Chi Minh. Oh, no, sorry, Ho Chi Minh. Um, Ho Chi a little farther back, right? No, yeah, no, no, no. Ho Chi Minh is a little later. That, that's <laughs> that's North Vietnamese. The, 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 the South Vietnamese sort of puppet government and okay. was our ally. And then the general said enough. And so they're going to take him out. And so he's sitting there. It's like this young guy. He learns Vietnamese. He's hearing this. And he realizes the world is not as huh. it would be. Then he, because he speaks Vietnamese, his job is he's a translator for torturers. And it's horrific. It's early in the war. He comes back and he founds um, what would become a network. I mean, this is a great story in itself. Yeah. Uh, 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 a paper, newspaper called Vietnam GI, buy and for GIs, an anti war paper. This is long before John Kerry, much more militant than John Kerry. And um, I'm just realizing younger readers or listeners are like, John Kerry would, who? <laughs> um, uh, and, um, and he died in 1969. He had been exposed mm -hmm. not to Agent Orange, which we've heard about. Agent Orange was actually the diluted form of something called Agent Purple. It sounds like a joke, but it's oh a terrible gosh. thing. Yeah. And he died at 27 and 69. I was named after him. So I grow up sort of with this idea of, on the one hand, this magical world, Narnia, you know, the Middle Earth. On the other hand, like I'm named after this guy who died trying to tell the truth about what was happening in Vietnam. And um and you know, that's a path that's laid out before you. And 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 I ended up trying to take it and trying to honor that name. So yeah, oh that's gosh. the background. Well, thanks for sharing that story. It's so horrible to hear about the way that he died, and oh, but what a legacy, huh? My goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's um um. That there ended up being. I mean, and that's a. This is sort of like a. I think about this now because right, we're here. We are in this moment, and the the book is subtitled, you know, a slow civil war. Right. Well, right. This is where we are, and and that means thinking about 
you know, we all know that kind of internet stuff of the resistance, right? Sure. Uh, but really, seriously, how do we struggle in these times of impending or ascendant uh -huh. fascism, right? And I think about what these guys did. This is before the internet. So he makes this little newspaper. It's all, and the, it's, it's, it's American Samizdat, you know, underground. And, and it tells you, tells you how, what's really going on in the war, what's really happening. Mm -hmm. This is not stars and stripes start spreading around. Um, you can get court-martialed for holding it if you're in Vietnam. Okay. But other guys at other bases, uh, start making their own newspapers. So it ended up, there's a, a, an archive at New York University, about 300 of these papers, different papers, each little base. And it's a little bit like before the internet, you know, we were joking around about inventing the internet. It's a little bit before the internet, these guys invented a kind of social media, yeah. but it was passed on hand by hand and they built a resistance. And, and, and that's important to me, actually, in terms of thinking about that resistance, we imagine, and now I know we're going back way before, but this is sort of relevant to how do we understand, like, like what, what, what can we do to stop fascism today? Um, the, the official story, right, of how we ended the Vietnam War is protesters went out in the streets. Historians of the era know not that really didn't do much. Uh, what ended the Vietnam War, first of all, let's be really clear, was the Vietnamese. They won. Mm. they won yeah um, right, right. the second thing was the mass scale mutiny of u.s soldiers really um and on a on a scale that i mean it's been written about in scholarly books never really in a public you know public history book uh -huh. and 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 that's fascinating to me that's all organized like how do you how do you i look at today um uh, I look at since, you know, the penultimate chapter of The Undertow is about uh, um, the aftermath of the downfall of Roe and um, what we don't get reported. And I was just talking to friends and I'm not going to go into too many details right now. All, all, all the underground abortion providing networks that are springing up that have long been planned in those anti-abortion states and um you know, you see that kind of work. There's the kind of work that takes place like a million people in the street. Hooray. Uh -huh. And then there's the hard, gritty work of um, how do I get my anti-Vietnam paper to this guy at the next right. base? Or how do I get this pregnant person across the Texas border right now so that she is not forced to bear a child? They don't want to force. And, and that kind of social creativity is always there and, and and very exciting to me wow do you i wonder because of your experience because of your familiar experience do you have you tended to gravitate towards vietnam literature fiction or non-fiction or kind of like i'd rather not i think I, like I, tobias wolf or something you know i have i've read tobias wolf and and uh you know when i when i was growing up my my, my father was one of the uh he was actually one of the first college professors to teach a course about vietnam wow in uh, 76 or 75 oh, wow. um, and then when I was growing up you know he was always developing the course and uh, and he would show films and uh, this is in the very very early days of VCRs and such we didn't have them at home so we'd go to the college to see them and you know uh, I'd be hanging out with my dad and he's like, well, I've got to, you know, I got to decide if I'm going to use this film. I'm going to go uh, look at uh, this film, The Apocalypse Now. You can come with me. And I'm like, oh, hey, man. You know? yeah. so I, I was watching those movies and I grew up watching those movies and Hamburger <laughs> Hill and all those kinds of things. And uh, for a while, I thought of writing um, and, and an earlier book of mine that nobody's seen called uh, Sweet Heaven When I Die, although it's one of my favorites. Really? Uh, there's an essay called Bad Moon Rising and it's about that legacy of the first Jeff Charlotte as a writer and um, as a person who was just doing their best to tell the truth and so on. And I thought about writing a book about um, that whole story. And I haven't in, in some ways, because every time I think I've written, I've been writing about right wing movements for 20 years. And every time I think, okay, I've paid my dues. I've written enough about this stuff. There's other things I want to write about. 
it feels too urgent, you know, right now. I mean, this book, The Undertow, it's like, I'm done. I, I The last book I did was not this kind of thing. And I'm like, I'm done with this kind of thing. And yeah. then my kids, I have a 14 and a 10 now, but, you know, a few years ago. And I'm like trying to tell them, how do I speak to my kids? Well, growing up in the age of Trump, how do I give them hope? And in the age of climate crisis, so-called, sure. uh, how do I say it's going to be okay? I can't say it's going to be okay. That's a lie. I don't know that. Yeah. I can say, here's how we struggle, right? No cheap grace, no false notes. Yeah. And and so I keep getting dragged back into the present. And it feels in some ways like an honor to have those, uh. have those to have the ability to do something with that, to be able to say something to my kids, to say, look, all right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to use my skills to report on this and tell these stories. It might illuminate this for others. Uh-huh. Uh, that's how we find some hope is by looking at the thing clearly looking yeah. at it in the sunlight just when i thought i was out they pulled me back in you know? <laughs> yeah 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 exactly man, the sopranos man. it's all the sopranos it turns out every story <laughs> back to the sopranos what you were just saying uh, i i did i just just pop, popped into my head i don't know that you even know the answer but you know you talk about like i don't know i think of like page the pageantry of like not pageantry that's not the word but you know world war ii and like you know the right wing movements that you've you've covered and you know some of them obviously like outright um idolize the nazis and you know and horrible right wing folks like that and fascists how do they see but i could also see like a weird you know like a idolatry if you will of like the american forces you know what i mean there was just you know a band of brothers that type of thing yeah, yeah. i wonder if if there's any if right wing in general i know that's hard to to generalize what they see with the vietnam war if anything you know what i mean was that like oh man we got we got screwed. We tried to take it to those communists. Like, how, how do they see that? Well, I mean, you know, you're a teacher. I, I teach students just a few years older than yours. And uh-huh. what's fascinating to me is to see that young people today barely know what the Vietnam War yes. was. Yes. They don't know what the Soviet Union was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, this is being the dilemma of a lot of uh, public school education. Like, let's stop a little bit shy of where things get really controversial and uh-huh. just talk about that, right? Because we don't want to argue with parents. Right. And I think about, uh, I'm 51 and I've been writing, you know, for a while. I think about in the uh, sort of early days of my writing life, um, the last book I published called was called This Brilliant Darkness in 2020. And in it, it is a story um, from the very beginning of my writing life. I'm like 20, 21, writing for an alt weekly in San Diego and writing on homelessness, the homelessness beat. And uh-huh. there was this homeless guy who was living outside the place uh, where I was staying and he would read my stuff and he kind of think like, it's all right, but you know, you kind of got it. Wrong. And um, I remember talking uh, about him, Jim, and I ended up writing about Jim and, and him sort of bringing me into that world in a way that I couldn't see as an outsider. Hmm. And um, Jim would introduce himself to me as a Vietnam vet and a veteran of a particularly horrific siege at a place called Khe San. And I remember telling my dad that. I'm like, yeah, I'm talking to this guy. He's like, really? How old is this guy? And I can't remember how old he is. And so my dad does the math in his head. And he says, so wait a minute, he was 13 when he was at Khe San. Wait a minute. No, so that guy wasn't there. But when I was young, that's how you spoke of the whole, a lot of homeless guys uh-huh. Let's say they were in Vietnam because they're trying to convey they are victims of a broad kind of assault on human dignity. And yeah. the only language people can hear is Vietnam. And they can hear from the left and they can hear from the right. Uh-huh. And at the time, we have movies like, you know, Rambo and First Blood yeah. redefining that Vietnam story. I, look, I grew up on this stuff, too. And I don't know. You you look a few years younger than me, but we're probably in the same ballpark. Yeah. Um, I think of a uh, 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 Red Dawn with Patrick Swayze. Okay. This, the Soviets invade Middle America, and Patrick Swayze leads the football team <laughs> out into the mountains in Colorado, where they become guerrilla fighters. Right. Yeah. And man, this movie is super exciting, right. and, and I love this as a kid. And it's a romance. Sure. And I think for the right, through Rambo, through Red Dawn. Uh huh. Red Dawn, which was made by a guy named John Milius, um, whose daughter now is a leading figure of the contemporary right. Mm. Um, uh, 
the uh who also wrote by the way apocalypse now you know ah, in this wow. you start to see the romance of despair and war sure. um, and the undertow there's a, a photograph of a young man uh that i met in wisconsin and it's just a close-up of his chest right and he's got a cross mm -hmm. a crucifix and at the center of the crucifix is uh part of a, a ruger uh bullet shell casing mm -hmm. and he's a marksman um, and on the back of his shirt is Rambo. And here it is, decades later. This guy is 19. Right. The way I was 19, you know, at that time. And that myth of Rambo. I, I wonder, I, I would have loved to ask that guy. I didn't think to ask him, like, do you even know what Vietnam? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah. what, you know, what is Vietnam? He might not even know the name of the country, but that myth of the stabbed in the back soldier. And that comes, that becomes central. So in, in the book, you know, the undertow, the title essay is dedicated to, in some ways, following the, the ghost, the myth of this woman, Ashley Babbitt, this right. this 30 something white, uh, uh, white woman killed on January 6, 2021, goes there to storm the Capitol, she puts it to be boots on the ground uh -huh. for Donald Trump. And she's a veteran, 14 years. Yeah. Two theaters, Afghanistan and Iraq, right? Yeah. Joined at 17. Wasn't always a fascist, was a Democrat. Fa second favorite president was Obama, right? Uh, but she goes and she gets killed. And the reason I knew she was going to be a martyr, one, she was a white woman killed by a black man. <laughs> it's an old racist story in American life. <laughs> but two, she's a veteran. She had actually been a member of and when she was in the military, something called the Capitol Guardians. Their job was to guard the Capitol. Yeah. And she gets shot by a Capitol police officer. Wow. This is this is this is central to the Rambo story, to the Vietnam story. And you go all the way back, World War One story. This it's called the stabbed in the back myth. Uh, it's a German uh, word for it. I can't pronounce it. Okay. The stabbed in the back, the idea that an honest veteran. The state has turned sour, has turned uh -huh. poor, yeah, and has betrayed her. And so I think that is the legacy that what Vietnam in the, the war in Vietnam infused in American life is a kind of despair, but also an American version of the stabbed in the back myth. Because you were talking about the World War II stories. In the World War yeah. II stories, you know, the Americans are always heroes, whether they always were or not, sure. right? In Vietnam, it's messy. They're betrayed. Rambo says, mm. remember Rambo, Sylvester Stallone says, we're going to be allowed to win this time. You know, do we have to fight this war with uh, one uh, behind our back? Yeah. Prelude to the deep state. The idea that uh, uh, make America great again, it would be great, but there are people within, enemies within, who are sure. undermined. Sure. Pretty, that's a pretty dang good Stallone impression, by the way. No, thank you. Thank that you. Was good. That was good. Yeah. That was good. I think I was kind of not raised on, but like, I, I mean, I, the Vietnam movies I think of are like apocalypse now, which is, I guess you get to see how they romanticize, but it's, and I mean, that's dark, you know, shoot on born on the 4th of July. That's yeah. 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 You know, I mean, just depressing. Ron, and uh, what's his name? Ron, Ron Kovic. Sort of a hero. Yeah. Ron, Ron what was Kovic. it? Kovic. Yeah. Kovic or Kovic. Yeah. Kovic. So, but, but I, I definitely see what you're talking about with the, the romanticize. I mean, platoon. think about platoon, right? So yeah. platoon was full metal jacket. <laughs> full metal jacket. I mean, I've watched all these movies, and and the romance of those movies. Let me take platoon, maybe Academy Award, Willem Dafoe. Uh -huh. It's an anti-war movie made by Oliver Stone. The yeah. signature image that you remember from platoon: mm -hmm. Willem Dafoe running. He's been betrayed by fellow soldiers, not stabbed in the back, sure. but been betrayed by the military. And he's running and he falls to his knees mm. and his arms are outspread. The same Willem Dafoe who plays Jesus in The Last Temptation of Christ. Yes. He's crucified. Uh, right? This is the romance. It's a it's the beautiful death. Uh-huh. You know, it's a martyr, it's a martyr story. So you yeah. can even have an anti-war movie. Mm. I would say Apocalypse Now is I think it's a great work of art. Uh-huh. And it is an anti-war story. And it's also a romantic story. Yeah. I mean, it is gorgeously shot. It is aesthetic. Sure. Uh, uh, I think about this now because as I'm traveling around the country, 
for this book, The Undertow, and talking to people about civil war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things after January 6th, I started hearing academic scholarly historians, my wife's a historian, um, not of this era, so she wasn't through this, mm -hmm. but other historians saying like, wait a minute, the, the, the conditions of civil war are actually almost present here. Mm -hmm. And that kind of talk had been fringe right wing talk. But now I hear very cautious historians mm -hmm. talking about this. So I go out and I start talking to people and, and I really only get one answer. Yes. And two variations, is it uh, uh, yes, and I can't wait, you know? Mm. The, the, the blood is thrumming in their cheeks yeah. as they think yeah. about it. And yes, or yes, it's sad, but it must happen. But all these people are not really, they're imagining a war movie. They're not imagining war. And I think about this now, when I think about every now and then, and this breaks my heart. And if if you got lefty listeners who are out there like, well, those right wingers think they got guns. We got guns too. First of all, there's 400 million guns in civilian hands in the United States. Half the civilian gun, uh, civilian held guns in the world on the planet are in the United States. Wow. And and, and no, they're not in the lefty John Brown gun clubs. Sure. Um, sure there's a little bit of that. But also, I I see I meet young folks who are like, yeah, we'll fight them in the streets. Uh huh. There is no good civil war. And so, what about the civil war? We won. We ended slavery. Yeah. Did we? You right. know, it, it lingers right. with us. It's an awful, awful thing. And in part, I wrote this book. I didn't want it to be romantic uh -huh. and beautiful in a sense. Yeah, I wanted us to sort of think like. Look at the broken people yeah. who are fantasizing about this. Look yeah. at the brokenness in yourself and put that fantasy aside and do what you need to do to avoid that horrible situation. Well, I want to get back to that in a minute. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes I'm not so good at this. So I love to do this first. Um, tell us, you know, give us some of the info about the book, you know, where, where you might recommend we buy it. Obviously it's available everywhere. Do you have any particular, you know, favorite bookstores? Um, yeah. Where, where am I talking to you at? Where, where, Sacramento, Where, California. Well, Sacramento, well, Sacramento, yeah. Well, it's in featured the, in the book, yeah, yeah. You featured in the book, but I, while I was there, I didn't get to visit any bookstores, so I want you to go to whatever uh, <laughs> independent in Sacramento is. I'll shout out Capital Bookstores, but um, but yeah, I mean, are you like like you know Bookshop.org or particular places in your area? Yeah, I mean, look, look, you know, get the buy, get the book wherever you can. Amazon's a problem. I don't uh -huh. judge people for buying from Amazon. <laughs> um, but buy independent if you can. And I'll say this, so that this is a book about the threat we face uh, from impending fascism. And I think libraries, and to a lesser extent, but still there, independent books, yeah, get it from your library. Yeah, They don't have it, say, well, you order it so I can read it and someone else can read it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, those, those places are on the front line and the right knows this. This is why they're book banning movements. This is why, you know, uh, guys with guns sometimes line up outside of libraries hmm. and uh, in independent bookstores, too. And I'm not like I'm not I'm not romantic about independent bookstores. A lot of them. Sure. Um, but we still got to go with them. Right. A lot of them like, oh, you're an independent bookstore. And that's why you stock only the top 50 titles from Amazon. And you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> You have freedom, choose what you want. And they don't always do that, but still you hold yeah. on. And your local library, your local library might just have shelves and shelves of bestsellers because that's uh -huh. what people want to check out, right? Yeah. You hold on to those institutions in the same way that you still vote. You say, well, I vote. And you know, the machine, the electoral college is kind of messed up and so on. Mm -hmm. The institution is imperfect. You still have yeah. to hold on to it because the alternative. So go get this book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War, from your library or your independent bookstore Ooh. or you know bookshop.org or 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 wherever it, wherever it is and 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 do get it i would say because i think i think when i started writing this book and i came up with that subtitle scene i've been reporting on the right for 20 years but i was like well i've been looking at the undertow the currents that are leading us to this moment and then i thought well now this slow civil war you know what uh, maybe, 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 I, I, maybe it's going to be calmed down. You know, yeah. maybe by the time this book comes out, people are like, oh God, how hyperbolic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, this is the week that Donald Trump, the 99 all but certain front runner 
not only for the Republican nomination, but for the presidency. No candidate has ever come back since polling began in 1945 from the hole that Biden is in now. Trump is leading. People say, oh, it's just old white guys. Trump is leading in 18 to 29 year olds. Trump is leading with LGBTQ writers. Trump is has historic leads now, not leads, but like percentages uh -huh. of every minority group. America, I thought he might have to steal the election. He doesn't have to. He's he, yeah. he might be in it, right? So we are facing this moment. So now we have to say, okay, well, what is the moment? How do we look at it? And that's what the book is. And it's not wonky or telling you, right. you know, it's not expository. It's wondering, it's traveling. And this is how I think the other subtitle, I, you know, I would never give the book the subtitle because I'm not so presumptuous. How to tell stories about fascism. Hmm. Well, the truth is I don't really fully know, but as a journalist, I've been covering the right for 20 years, journalist for 30 years. I know that whatever we're doing is not working. Hmm. I'm watching the press return not to 2020, but to 2016, reporting yeah. on horse race. Nikki Haley up five points. <laughs> Who the fuck cares? Seriously, These are seriously. not contenders. Let us report on... <laughs> The front runner saying, quoting Hitler. Right. And then right. saying, he said this week, he said several times, he says, the immigrants from all over the world, from South America, from Africa, from Asia, they They're are poisoning, poisoning right? the uh -huh. blood of our nation. And then just in case he didn't get it, he does it again. Yeah. And then he says, you know, I haven't read Mein Kampf, which was real weird because nobody had asked him. Uh -huh. You know, it's a little bit like, uh, 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 what right? you have to do the old political thing if you have to answer the question uh, uh, no, why no I don't beat my wife Trump uh, just, no one asked him and he's like by the way if you're thinking I sound like Hitler yeah, I yeah. have read the book from which I just literally plagiarized a lot yeah. poisoning the nation declaring his enemies vermin and I just spent the last couple of weeks reading something called Project 2025 you don't want to know 900 pages by the right-wing think tanks giving trump the full blueprint he needs from day one to declare the insurrection act martial law to start creating concentration camps to criminalize uh trans folks it is everything that he wanted to do and trump won but didn't have the wonk power to do it so that's why we've got to face this stuff and i can see the people saying like, i don't want to read this book because i just don't want to know <laughs> My no, hope you do is want to read this book. You do want you to do want to read the book, and I try and frame it with some hope and some loveliness and some beautiful and, uh, and some songs and so on. Mm -hmm. But even when I'm in the dark places, to try and tell it as a story rather than a cudgel. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that'll work. It's it's my it's my bet. It's my hope. He he doesn't even want to be president, right? He doesn't want to do the duties. He, I mean, I, I just, what you're talking about him and just all of these things that will affect millions and millions of lives. He just doesn't care about anything other than his ego. And he doesn't even want to be president. He didn't want to be president. I, I just, I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. It's just, I mean, you mentioned, I think in the book the you know, when, when Barack Obama, you know, kind of w was playing with them at that, at the correspondence dinner or whatever, like, I mean, what yeah. an ego. That just, I mean, and and this is a man who's what seventy seven years old. He said he'd be seventy eight if he if he takes office. Well, he didn't want to be president. Uh, version one, he thought like this would be an opportunity. But now, yeah, he really does want to be yeah. president. But the thing is, we have to understand. I tried to be careful about using the term Trump and Trumpism. Trumpism. Uh -huh. So, we, if you talk to political scientists, they'll say the age of Reagan doesn't go from nineteen eighty to nineteen eighty eight. It goes uh -huh. from nineteen. 2016 and you say how could that be we got barack obama we got bill clinton because in that long span right um in the 1980s 2016 politics in america is determined by the parameters of reaganism and you have a conservative version the bushes and uh -huh. you have a liberal version the obama and the clintons and so on right. but it's still this is the imagination 2016 with trump's victory we enter what I call in the book, the Trumpocene, the age mm -hmm. of Trump. Now this means that we're, you know, every politician out there is still talking in terms of Trumpism. Uh -huh. This is why you have every other Republican candidate, they're all, all the, they're, they're campaigning on Trump's platform, yeah. right? The Republican party is on Trump's platform. 